have you heard of this phrase before? Mm. Africans. Have it, you heard it before? It, yes, yes, I have. Um, and to a very large extent, it's associated with mediocrity, with uh, uh, success being inspired by Europe. Uh, and not feeding our own people, not being self-sufficient, and poverty. And that is what we are trying to get away from. And as a farmer yourself, what do you think is the way forward? I think we need to come together uh, and uh, have servant leadership and be able to listen to each other and if people can just hope to do something positive for their country, if people stop being selfish and want to control large chunks beyond what they can consume or creating reasonable wealth for your family, you tend to have those who want to have everything in Africa and those who have nothing. We just need to have uh, business people, political leaders, uh, church leaders, who don't want to amass everything to themselves, who are wanting to share the cake with others, who are the concept of growing together, uh, the concept of knowing that if you are privileged to be at the top, you need to have other people surrounding you to make even your business stronger and share the cake with others. This, oh my goodness! No, this, is the... this is so huge! Shamiso or Samiso? Shamiso Fang. Where is the name coming from? It's actually named after my wife. Wow. Uh, she is the managing director of the farm actually and when we decided to leave the red race from working uh, I had to convince her to come and stay on the farm to leave the bright lights of Ferrari and her name means wonders in Shona uh, or a special wonder uh, so therefore I wanted it to be a wonderful place for her to live, to raise the kids and to also help to feed the nation. Wow. I mean, you're actually living in a wonder world. I mean, this place looks like a garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. You said you named your farm as your wife's name, right? Shamiso. Yes. What is the inspiration behind that? Um, what really inspired that? Um, oh, from a cultural perspective, a good home is always kept by the wife. And I believe that uh, women, especially when you are going through the tough times of the beginning, if you involve them, they are more steadfast, they are more thrift and everything. And true to, the, to, to that, she, she has been a backdrop of the operations on the ground, of the finer details on the ground. Because at the beginning, when you are setting up the business, you understand you, you have to be on the run, sourcing the funding, mm. the building, but somebody has to maintain the calm. And she did that effectively. And the fact that he said during the toughest time, he was there with you, I'll be so happy to know Oh, what was the toughest time that you went through that your wife still remained behind you? Yeah. Yeah, like I said, um, uh, we've been married now for close to 29 years. Uh, and yeah, in the beginning, uh, I, I come from humble beginnings, so does she. Maybe she comes from a slightly better background than me. But at the end of the day, uh, we, we didn't start with any resources. Uh, it was our incomes from work and once we st I stopped working, a year later she stopped working. So she was w willing to get her hands dirty and up to today she used to wake up 
where he does scored and do the numbers and so on. And uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, I'm lucky that she's good with numbers <laughs> and uh, she, she does the counting <laughs> because, you know, in business, if you can not deduce it to dollar terms, if you yeah. cannot count the, the cents, yeah. uh, you are doomed to failure. Somebody has to make sure that what needs to be done has to be done every day continuously because to be successful you have to do those difficult things of repeating and improving the same things over and over again and as an entrepreneur and as an imaginative person I tend to look at the big picture I tend to want to do too many things and she's been the one who has been saying no no let's stick to the, so to the game. Yeah I agree with the uh, phrase um, to be a successful man you need a woman behind you. Yes, that's definitely correct. Uh, I, I believe that 100%. Shamiso. Yeah, hi. <laughs> wow. Knowing that you've been named after this farm, how does that make you feel? I'm um, honored. Um, wow. I'm, I'm happy about it. And... Um, Sometimes I feel it's a bit too much for me, but <laughs> I'm okay. It's all right. Uh, he said during the struggles, you stood behind him. And um, that is why I want to ask, why would you do that? I mean, you could have just left and enjoy your business or enjoy your time or your life, but I decided to stand by him. Why would you do that? Um, I didn't decide to stand by him as per se. We were <laughs> working together. That's what I can say. So standing by someone is when they go into trouble or you say, ah, now I will stand with you. But when you're doing your things together, you know, you, you stand by each other's side. That's what I can say. Throughout this journey, what was the yeah, major, throughout the journey. Uh, what was the major challenges that you both, both of you faced? Um, when we left work, employment, uh, it was tough because we are the first generations to have um, what we are doing right now. It was a bit tough for us and challenging. When I look back, that's when I say it was tough. At that time, it was a challenge that we were enjoying. Everybody else was laughing at us. You want to go into farming, you know, big around, when was that? Mm, early 2000s. People say, you want to do farming? You know, people in Zimbabwe were not like, <coughs> they didn't consider farming as a business. But we saw, we had the vision that we could do something with farming. And living employment where you were, I mean, paid well. It was not the decision that everybody was looking at at that moment. We were very young at that moment. And to think of something like that, you could go into farming and leave your formal employment, it was something that people would love you at. You, you took a huge risk. Yes. How would you do that? I think we had the um, zeal and the passion. And when we were doing, I mean, our figures and numbers, we really wanted to create wealth for our families. We didn't want to just have an income at the end of the month. We wanted to have something that we knew we could live for the next generations to come. Yes. What were you doing? Like, what kind of job were you doing? I was an administrator. Hey, and on the farm too, you are an administrator? Yeah, managing the farm. I <laughs> said so you do a bit of calculations every day. Yes, I do. Uh, trying to keep everything running smoothly. I'm more on the operations and the management. Would you say that um, the decision that you took years ago was really worth it? I am very happy about the decision that I made. I wouldn't trade it for anything. You know, um, back then, by now I could be owning a house, maybe in Borodo, but now I own properties. And um, I wouldn't have owning what I own right now. And the amount of information and um, experience that I've gained, um, I, I mean, I'm miles apart from my colleagues that I worked with, some of the colleagues that didn't move from their jobs.
My name is Wadamaya, the one and only annoying village boy from Ghana who is on a journey to change the negative narrative of Africa and also celebrate African excellence. I came to Zimbabwe and so many people are saying, I need to speak to you. You see, like, I don't even know your real name. All I know is Shamiso. Can you tell me who you are and um, where you come from? My name is uh, Samson Chauruka. I uh, come from actually chieftainship in the Eastern Highlands of uh, uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, I'm 51 years old. Uh, I'm a social entrepreneur. I support uh, smallholder farmers, the commercialization of the smallholder sector. I've been actively involved at national level in advancing the interests of the smallholder sector, mm. in making them have access to the competitive genetics and breeding. Um, yes, we do a mentorship program. We, uh, we, we are involved at the various sectors in order to make it a commercial industry for the small to medium size. Of course, that's where you get the large scale uh, employment and value transfer to the, uh, to the marginalized communities. So the whole land is how many hectares? Uh, it started off as 54. Uh, we now remain with uh, 30 hectares. Uh, we've subdivided and allowed other smallholder farmers to come and leverage off our expertise. But yeah, we remain with 30 hectares of land. What kind of farming are you doing in here? Um, well, yeah, it's a combination of a lot of things. <laughs> Uh, different <laughs> concepts, uh, but primarily our main uh, farming is uh, um, pigs, there is cannabis, uh, medicinal cannabis, uh, there is uh, chickens, uh, there is the agro-tourism part of it as well. Uh, we do a bit of cattle, we mm. trying to put a different number of animals. We've just removed the goats and sheep we had, but we are coming up with a new batch of uh, goats and sheep. Can, can I say you're a millionaire? Wow. Well, I don't know. I, I just don't know. <laughs> yes, I would say so. <laughs> and are we heading to billion, billion anytime soon? No, I think maybe two, three generations. It's not a, a run, a race. We hope that our children and our children's children will add more value to this enterprise. And I think real value grows over time. And for me, I believe that you create value, then the money follows. And therefore, generational value, the knowledge, the experience through one generation to another will create the lasting wealth forever. You, you believe in generational wealth? Yes, uh, as, you, uh, as you become aware, uh, we have got four boys. Uh, uh, actually five with one we adopted from my late brother. Uh, the two older boys, 127, 125, are already embedded within the operations. They went to school, came back to Africa uh, and uh, got involved in the business. And you can actually see that they are bringing more dimensions to the business, more modern aspects to the business. Yes, we are already in our second generation. You've been 20 years here on the farm, uh, so it's a generation already, and I think we are also speaking to the next generation, even the third generation, because I'm expecting the boys to start getting married <laughs> soon. <laughs> yeah. You're building a generational world yes. through farming. True. How, how is that possible? Uh, well, yes, uh, farming is like any other business. Uh, it's a value chain of activities and as you go around the farm you actually see that we are now transiting from the basic growing of the uh, or the farming of the animals to value addition, the slaughter, the abattoirs, the Warsaw shop which is coming up and so on and hopefully in the next year or so we'll be doing processing into value-added products like polonies, uh, bacon, hams and so on. So yes, we are looking at going uh, into the agro-industry agro rather than just farming as traditionally we, we, we said. So I, I want to know, you ever left Zimbabwe? Yeah. Actually, 
my family, a lot of it has left Zimbabwe and I took a bet that I'll only leave Zimbabwe in order to visit and enjoy Europe because I'll make the value first in Zimbabwe. You know that the crisis in Zimbabwe over the land reform which came to Zimbabwe, mm. uh, which was done in Zimbabwe, the, a lot of skilled people, and I happened to be one of, and with my siblings, including even my twin brother, decided to go to Europe and into America. And of course, the temptation was there. But once I decided that I was going to create the necessary change for us Africans to see ourselves in a different way in order to take control of our own destiny. I came down, left Arari, left Bright Rides, came to the farm, buckled down, started building from the bottom. I had to buy, unfortunately I didn't get land under land reform like most people did. I had to buy this land uh, and started building basically from scratch most of the infrastructure on this farm. Wow. At the same time, sending kids to school and so on. Yeah, it was a tough journey. But if you dream and want to live your dream, the sky is the limit. So since you never left Zimbabwe, yes. which means you are made in Africa product. Yes, I am. And you know, if you go back into the real understanding, you understand that Africa has got more resources uh, than any other nation, be uh, any other continent, be it minerals, be it uh, re holiday resorts, be it in agriculture. 60% of the agricultural land in the world still available is in Africa. Uh, uh, in, uh, in particular, on Southern Africa, it's a natural. 80% uh, of what can grow anywhere in the world will grow best in Southern Africa. And in Zimbabwe in particular, if you go a thousand years, we always have been the breadbasket of Africa and into Asia and so on and things like that. And even if you go back 30 years back, mm. the best of products eaten in Europe, be beef, be it uh, uh, vegetables in Amsterdam, flowers and so on, Zimbabwe always played a pivotal uh, role. They actually had specified quotas of the premium grade products coming from there. Hmm. So once you start understanding your own value, and unfortunately as most Africans we suffer from the case of the resource rich nations where we don't actually understand and appreciate those value around us and we end to run we tend to run for the muscles of the inferior product. So for me with the horse or land reform program coming in Zimbabwe, even if I missed out on getting land, because I'd been in industry which was agro-related and so on, it was a natural to understand that that void left had to be filled by none other than us Africans, none other than us Zimbabweans. We had to learn to feed our people and to also have the surplus to be fed. So will you say that it's possible to make it in Africa? I 100% agree. As you, are, you can see, the second generation here went to some of the best schools here in Zimbabwe, went into Europe, into America, and on finishing their studies, they were clear they were, had more value here in Africa. And I want to say that thank you so much for being an African, not an African. <laughs> no, no. Yes, I'm a, I'm, I'm a true African. And like you said, uh, the proof of the pudding is in the eating and you can see what we are trying to do here. Since you became a millionaire from the continent, I want to ask, when did you make your first million? Um, I quit my job as an uh, executive in industry at 31. I uh, knuckled down, I started uh, trading in cattle, I started doing large-scale chicken production. Yeah, by the time I was 34, 35, I'd made my first million, including buying this land and a lot of other small little pieces of uh, properties and so on. Uh, Just trading with cattle can make you a millionaire? Yes, 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 yes. I, I, I was buying between 50, 100 cattle almost every week at one time 
putting through my retail outlets and also wholesaling to other butchery uh, outlets. Yeah? That, that means like the funds that were raised from the corporate world, that's when you used it to start your cutting mm -hmm. business? No, 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 no. Well, to be honest, I didn't even get my pension because when I, the, the bug hit me that I had to leave, I didn't have time to wait for the six months, which was then at the time requirement for an executive to leave. So they actually took back my, well, my money. So I never even actually got my pension. Wow. Uh, I had to trade off the small little cars I had and so on and to start from scratch. We started very basic, uh, we opened tuck shops, we were selling fish from the back of the car. Then the story just started building and building. Uh, uh, and yeah, we then bought our land, we then bought these things. I didn't have any retirement package at all. Trust me, this is the best story since I ever came to Zimbabwe. So do me a favor, like the video, share so that so many people can have a piece of this. I want to know, is the pig farm your first ever business? No, it's not. Uh, I've tried other things. I've been in manufacturing. I've always known that at the end of the day, people need to eat. And with Africa, we know that there is generally a rural to urban migration. 72% mm. of Africans are below 35. And most of them are being attracted by the uh, bright lights. That's leaving a gap for production. They need to eat. They need to be provided for. And why would we then wait for products coming from Africa, from Europe or from America to feed our own people? So people have to just take a back, uh, uh, one step backwards and understand that as we modernize, as we urbanize, there is need for more intensive farming, there is mm. more need for more serious commercial farming, not um, a sub subsistence farming. And I saw a big, big yawning gap, not even for exports into Europe, but to feed my fellow Africans uh, in a variety of ways. So yes, the opportunities continue to grow as the African population continues to grow. How many pigs do you have right now? Yeah, around two and a half thousand. We, we, we are having around 60 deliveries a month. So every day the number is changing. Uh, it's uh, is it a, is changing. Is it a profitable business? Yes, it is. Uh, I think any business, if you do the fundamentals right, wow. uh, there's always a market, people are buying. Yes, the, any business has got challenges as you mitigate them. Uh, I think any especially the agro industry. So wanted to know, running a commercial farm like this here in Zimbabwe, what are the major challenges that you face in here? Okay, I will speak for livestock producers, uh, where we depend mostly, our major input is maize. Currently in Zimbabwe, we have um, uh, problems in finding maize and um, that's our major challenge. Mm. Um, yeah, that's what I can say is the major challenge that we face. And um, we have big um, companies that are also into um, uh, pig production. Okay. And we are sort of tagging behind them, you know. They set the pace for us. Sometimes we find ourselves in a situation where they can cut the prices where it's not as profitable for you to sell as, as I mean, as someone who's, who's upcoming. And you find a lot of farmers who end up selling their pigs wow. or their stocks because it's no longer profitable. I, I said it's profitable, but at that moment, when the big guys want you out, <laughs> they, reduce the price. they reduce the price. So that everyone will go in there. Yeah. Wow. Is that, there's no way you, you all can work together. Okay, this is the price that we are all going for. Yeah, that's what we want. To, that's where we want to go to. 
where we are also able to talk with the big guys or to have a regulation actually that stipulates I mean, the kind of environment that should exist for yeah, upcoming farmers sure within a, in a, in a, in an economy. Okay. Your house is just close to the pig farm. Yes, yes, which is a very important <laughs> thing for us. You can't smell the pigs. Because obviously you have to work with hygiene, you have to work with, like us here, we've put in biodigesters, green technology, also using the energy and so on to supplement, especially on the new structure who will go through the, the new development on the pigs. But yes, we live on the farm and most people when they come that side, they forget that we are actually <laughs> on the farm. Is this how you started? Yes, this is how we started. Uh, we built this in 2006 when we bought the farm in 2006. We built this in 2006. We used the bricks uh, primarily from the farm. We actually took entails, got some guys, made the bricks and built from, from scratch. Wow. Uh, right now we've just been doing a few renovations as we build the new structures. This has primarily become a farrowing house. Uh, uh, it sits on 2,000 square meters. The building is 1,600. Mm. It was initially built as a 100 sow unit, but right now we've got a farrowing unit which is uh, 65, 70 pens in there. We are having about 60 deliveries plus or minus every month. Uh, because of the heavy uh, cold, we are actually supplementing. This new section has just been built recently, and the challenge is with power. We actually have to do additional heating with firewood during the heavy winter like this one. But you can see wow, the, the piglets. You cannot actually not smell anything in here. I don't even feel like I'm in a pig farm. In a pig house, yeah. Uh, hygiene is very important for us. Is this not hay? Yes, this is the hay we use on the farrowing unit you saw where the piglets were right? mm. to keep them warm, to keep them comfortable. Uh, so we keep the hay here, we cover it with tents if the weather is bad. Uh, this is the extension I was telling you about. We are building the new houses you see we are going into. We are putting about uh, 11 of them. This is uh, one of the new farrowing houses. Oh my goodness! This is the, it's so huge! <laughs> this is one of the new sow units. Uh, yes. Uh, so, oh, you were not expecting No, I was not expecting this. I was so scared. Yeah, turn around. See the. I want you to see the, How How old? The, this, this, this is about three and a half years old. Two and a half years. Panache, my second son, uh -huh. is uh, mostly involved. This oh. is the AI station where we take the semen, where he then takes them to our lab and sort out them. Why do you deal with semen, bro? <laughs> 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 oh, insemination. You know like, about you that. You do the artificial insemination? Yes, artificial So they are all males? These are females. They're, These are females? Yeah, the males are uh, by themselves. In okay. One. The females will be in there. So in the morning they'll come and they'll be, and this is this, this is where it all happens. Oh! And then there are people who come and they collect the semen, and then from each bowl we can produce semen for about eight, eight, eight females every day. Every day. Yeah. So I would love to see how it's done, man. <laughs> this is the abattoir where we will be slaughtering the pigs. We'll put, we're putting up a dehera and uh, uh, that's how the, the, the abattoir will be looking. So you have to buy the machines too for this place? Yes. This is cost effective. 
Yeah. It is uh, one we are not having to carry our, pro uh, our, our animals from the farm. There's no need to go looking for permits from vet doctors and so on. So it just lowers the cost of doing things. And you, you're doing it in one place, you're just moving them from the uh, thing. But with over 2,500 pigs, how do you feed them? Yes, we, we, we make the feed. And, uh, Ninety percent of the feed we are making here, we already had a smaller feed uh, plant uh, which is already operational, but uh, we are now upgrading uh, and put a proper feed plant uh, complete uh, process and be able to say the excess feed we also able, able to give to the smallholder farmers at a discounted price, or, uh, as opposed for them to go to commercial producers to. To, to buy their own feed. So we just following the value chain to make sure that the cost of doing business uh, is managed and put under control. You said you're going to turn this place into agro-tourism. What are you doing then? Um, yeah, we are 27 kilometers from central Harare. Okay. And uh, agriculture is now a, a central part of the education system from Zimbabwe, from the lower primary school to secondary school. So we need to have places where they can come and see the practical side of things, a variety of things together, and it's two at the same of at the same time for them to enjoy the the, the, the the time in the farm and so on. So on the back of that, we we have a small dam on the farm. We're putting uh, tourist uh, aspect, swimming pools, we're putting a restaurant, we're putting a few things, five-a-side soccer and so on for kids to play. So we are actually tapping in in the government trust to develop agro-tourism centers. Like we said, we already teach farmers, we already bring in their stockmen and so on for training. Mm. We do mentorship program. Mm. So we, we, we believe that there is a lot of other untapped value which we can add to our business. So certainly we are developing this place as an agro-tourism uh, facility. You can see the way we are taming the, the different aspect of it. Well, you are even growing fruits in your backyard. <laughs> yes, uh, we, we want to be able to enjoy all the different type of fruits. You can see there's so many do, do different... Do you grow crops in here too? No, no, no. We, we, our operation is too big for the size of our farm to be focused on cropping. Uh, we also actually also support the other farmers who actually grow the raw materials for us. Generally, what we are trying to in future is to get farmers who don't have the resources to grow on our behalf and support them with tilling and the seeds and the fertilizers. Then we then buy the, the crop from them and take out the costs who they have supported. Can I tell you something? Okay. You're a visionary. <laughs> Thank you. We, we, we hope as Africans we should uh, be able to build our own countries. And I love the fact that you are changing the narrative of your own country, helping build Zimbabwe. I just want to know, um, what do you think is the problem of Africa? Um, I think over-politicization of the uh, critical sectors of the economy, mm. not allowing uh, uh, leadership to devolve to other areas to, to know that not everything is political. Of course, colonial hangovers and meddling and so on is still happening in a big way. For example, us as farmers, because the politics is not moving with what the West wants, you find that as businesses, we are hamstrung, we are operating on a cash economy, we can't borrow, we, it's very expensive to borrow, we, we can't access a lot of things, we can't buy directly to certain countries because we are under sanctions. So yes, so there's a lot of things we are... Is the sanctions to, affecting your business? Yes, it does, because you cannot transfer money uh, to buy equipment in countries where you are not allowed to trade. So there's a lot of restrictions in the banking system to which you have to navigate. And because there is no good money supply, yeah, and because there's expensive money supply, and operating a business this size on a cash basis is really cumbersome, is really 
difficult. And as a farmer yourself, what do you think is the way forward? I think we need to come together uh, and uh, have servant leadership and be able to listen to each other. And if people can just hope to do something positive for their country, if people stop being selfish and want to control large chunks beyond what they can consume or creating reasonable wealth for your family. You tend to have those who want to have everything in Africa and those who have nothing. We just need to have uh, business people, political leaders, uh, church leaders who don't want to amass everything to themselves, who are wanting to share the cake with others, who are the concept of growing together. Uh, the concept of knowing that if you are privileged to be at the top, you need to have other people surrounding you to make even your business stronger and share the cake with others and to make sure that you create employment, the money, the value is shared among uh, the community. I think we will all prosper. If you had a chance time. to change one thing in Zimbabwe, what will it be? The politics, like I said, it's really affecting us. We need to look at ourselves in a different uh, uh, perspective. The polarization is, is just wrong. We are the same people. We shouldn't be fighting. We should be all striving to build a prosperous Zimbabwe. It's endowed with so many natural resources. The people themselves, the ordinary people themselves, the minerals, the good agriculture, uh, so the education legacy which has been left, and so on. There is so many good things about Zimbabwe. If only we could appreciate what God has given us, we would be more humbled and want to build it to the next level. So many Africans watching us, what will be your final message to them? Africa is the next big thing. Let's all help build it for ourselves and for the next generations to come. Thank you. What is the secret behind your success if a young African entrepreneur is watching? Um, knowing that you don't know everything, sharing information with others, willing to make your hands dirty and to work, gain experience, start small and the ability to start. We have got so many educated people who write beautiful stories but never get to start them. Start in your current circumstances, wherever you are, within your own environment. There is something you can do which can change your own circumstances and the circumstance of those around you. The concept of thinking you build a Microsoft from nowhere, it's generations of effort of different people building the cake until it's that big. So in Africa, we need to go back and start from the basic and have people who start to do something different, who start to build value for their own communities. Let's not be professors and engineers who have not done anything even in their own village. Let's start there and change the lives of our own mothers, our own grandparents, our uncles, and in that vein, be building value to ourselves with people who appreciate us. I want to say thank you so much for talking to me and I appreciate your time. Thank, thank you. you.